let's begin. Welcome back, everybody. Um, we're going to pick up where we were last time, and we're just in the middle of this conversation about order statistics. So last time we did probably the thing everybody can figure out intuitively, where you've seen this example, it's easy to remember. But the max order statistic finding its distribution is just taking the original IID distribution and powering it up, up to n, where n is the number of samples. So, and that's the order statistic that we're looking for. And so what this really just says is it's the probability that all of the xi's are less than n. And so since everything is IID, it's just this product n times. So I'll just write this out just a little bit differently. It's just i goes from 1 to n, the probability that each xi is less than or equal to x. So that's all we're writing down. We'll replace the notation probability of xi being less than x with that creature right there, the cumulative distribution. So, and it just says all of the xi's are less than x, so that means that the max order statistic is less than x. Um, a common question I'll ask on a midterm is what's the probability that the minimum is less than x? And it's an equally easy calculation to do if you remember to take complements. So you have to take complements, flip the sign of everything so that you can say all of the xi's are bigger than something. So when you're saying something's bigger than something, it's not the cumulative, it's the complement of the cumulative. You'd product that up n times, and it would say all of the xi's are bigger than something. So 1 minus fx powered up to the n. And now we want to put that on a probability scale. We want to reverse the sign so that you need to complement again. So all I'm saying is this. 1 minus f of x to the n, 1 minus that thing. That's the cumulative probability of the minimum order statistic. So this right here is the probability that all of the xi's are bigger than x, all of them. But now I want to reverse the sign, and so I take the one minus thing. I foul people up on that question all the time. It lets me know that you don't, you didn't pick up on one of the five ways I've taught you to compute this. So I'm going to show you more general formulas that always work, and we'll get to at least one of them today. So in general, what we want to answer is what's the probability distribution for the Jake order statistic. So this is the Jake largest. And we probably want to know what's the accompanying density function for the jade largest. And so we want to know these two things. So that's what we're going to be building up to. Um, when we come back on next Friday, I'll be here Friday, we'll talk about the joint distribution of two order statistics and the joint distribution of many order statistics. Next time on Monday and Tuesday, Jayon is going to teach teach the bootstrap. Twenty years ago, this might have seemed sophisticated, and now I think they teach it to freshmen. I'm not sure that that's true, so it might be an exaggeration. If you don't know what it is, Jayon will give you a really good lecture on it. He'll motivate what we want to do in statistics. If we could do anything, we'd go back out into the population and resample all the time from the population. Uh, of course, if I told scientists to do that, like let's say I wanted to understand um, maybe this question, probability that x5 is less than 1, and maybe this represents some scientific process that scientists are going out and sampling from. So they go out and they sample six data points from here. And then they want to know what's the distribution of this thing right here, which this is the fifth biggest thing in the set. And I'm like, well, I can tell you what the fifth biggest thing is. So I read them the number back, and they say, well, I want to know the distribution. How much does it vary? And I say, well, go back out into the population and collect me six more data points. And I notice that data point kind of wiggles a little bit. It's not exactly in the same place. And I say, do it again. Do it a thousand times. Um, 
scientists would probably go get another statistician real quick. But what we want to do is effectively mimic that thing. The bootstrap says, instead of doing that, take your original data set and just resample from it over and over again. It's not exactly the same process, but if your original data set is representative of the distribution, resampling from a sample is the sample. And so it doesn't give you a better point estimator, it gives you an understanding of the variability of your point estimator. It's just resampling over and over again. If you don't understand that, Jay Young will explain it to you with a number of different examples on Monday and Tuesday. He's going to show you it in the context of some strange distribution called an additive mixture model. So you can basically form any distribution out of mixture models. So he's going to also introduce you to what an additive mixture model is, and we'll be using that in this class as well. The book doesn't focus a lot on mixture models, but that's one of my added bonuses to you. I'll give you a modeler's tool and how to do inference off of, you know, arbitrarily complex distributions. We'll talk about that later on, but J.O. will introduce you to it. If you want backup videos for this on 126, and this is 2022, and 128, 2022, these are the accompanying videos from last year. So if you want to check out those, so those are on my YouTube page. You can go back and see um, my version of the same lecture. So the code that Jay Young is going to use to simulate is the same code that I used last year. And um, that's also the same code that's online. There's a few places you have to uncomment things to make it work. So there's just two places where you kind of change the code. And Jay Young will show you where that is. Um, so, probably I would say intellectually, not a really challenging thing to understand the bootstrap, but I think as a, a practitioner's tool, it's a very useful thing. So I used to hate it because it was so simple, I thought that it was trying to mimic something Bayesian to me, and in some sense it is, and I used to think it's a cheap excuse for a posterior distribution, if you're doing like the parametric version of the bootstrap. And then I started thinking that's not actually a negative thing to have something that's effective, kind of does everything, um, but it's easier to implement. In the IID case, you can use this stuff. And I usually tell scientists if I don't have time to work with them, um, go do the bootstrap first. So I think it is actually um, cheap in terms of startup costs, you know, in terms of doing an analysis. So I kind of like the bootstrap. I also like it because it effectively teaches us what we would do if we were scientists and going back out and collecting data. So it kind of gives you a repetitive process that you can think about what you're trying to do. Okay. Um, I think that's all I want to say about that. So Monday, Tuesday, JM will be here and then I'll come back on Friday. And I'll say a few recap comments on this. We can talk about it if you want. If there's something that's confusing, we can spend a little bit of time on it. And then we'll just jump back into order stats. Uh, I will say that these lectures right here, it's the 27th right now. So you might think that we're falling behind, but last year we started up on the 11th. So we're actually ahead. So a little bit faster. Okay, let's come back to this problem. So I'm just gonna instead of talk about the J quarter statistic, Let's just conceptualize an easy problem and we can work through some of the arithmetic on all of this. And then we'll generalize everything that we wrote down. So I'm just going to think about this density function. It looks like this. And I'm going to collect six data points from it. And I'm going to talk about the distribution of the fifth order statistic. And the only reason I picked these numbers is because I can work through the calculus relatively easily. So, question is, is what is that thing? And I can mimic exactly this process on a computer and do this simulation. So I like to think about this as a process, and then we'll do some math that mimics the process, and I don't actually have to repeatedly sample from the population over and over again. That's effectively what statisticians are modeling, is what would happen if you did it again? What would happen on the next time? How are things distributed? And I think that's really important. I will mention on the bootstrap, 
it's not exactly a Bayesian analysis. If you do parametric bootstrap, if you know what it is, the intervals that you get are too tight. They're too small. And so I don't like that. I, I always like it if my intervals are a little bit wider because I like to express my uncertainty and I don't like to say I'm overly sure, but I've noticed when I work with people, they like the smaller intervals. <laughs> you know? so, they like to be fooled. It's a, it's a human condition. Okay, I coded this up. Christian, do you mind grabbing the front lights? We'll simulate it. We'll run this again. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back out into the population 100,000 times. And so I'm going to collect data sets of size 6, and then I'm just going to track the fifth largest thing. So I'm going to order each data set, take the fifth largest thing out of it. My code is general enough that I can plug in the J order statistics. So the inputs are what N is, and what J is the size of the order statistics. So I'll input N is six and j is equal to five. And I want to sample from that triangular distribution that I showed you. And I have some code that does that. So for each replicated sample from the population, effectively what I'm going to do is I'm just going to compute it like this. I'm going to get n samples from this where n is equal to six, and I'm getting n samples, six samples effectively from that distribution. And the thing that I ended up computing was square root of four times a random. Let's talk about that line of code real quick. So something extra. Christiana, if you don't mind. Let's just look at this. So we want to first sample from And we want to do this six times, but if I can do it once, I can repeat it six times. And so that one line of code is repeating something six times for us. Um, I want to take an xi, and I want to take it from this distribution, this density function, one half x, right here. And what I've said is that if I end up computing a uniform, so I just take a uniform 0, 1, and most computers know how to do this. This used to be worth discussing. So back in the 1960s, a Monte Carlo class would be all about that. So how do you generate uniforms in high dimensions? Everybody can do it one-dimensionally pretty well, but as you move into higher dimensions, it becomes a little bit more difficult. The built-in software for doing this is a lot better than back in my day. So we used to use linear congruential generators, Borland had a version that was pretty good. Nobody uses that stuff anymore. Now they use something called a Merzine Twister, and it's the built-in function in here. We have to talk about some pretty sophisticated mathematics to understand how that sampler works. But it gives us a uniform. That it looks uniform, it feels uniform. They're not actually uniforms, but they look and feel like uniforms. So this part is easy. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take square root of 4, times, let's just make sure I have this right, square root of four times this uniform. And I'm saying that's xi. Does anybody know why this works? It does work. Let's just run it real quickly. That's how I generate everything. Then I'm going to sort everything. And then I take the j biggest value and I hold that. So all of this is just sorting and then holding and then repeating 100,000 times. And then I show you a histogram of this statistic. So I show you a histogram of it, and I also compute the probability based off of this, how many of these samples is less than or equal to some number. I didn't plug in Y here. I plugged in a different number. I plugged in 1. So if I'm answering this question, what's the probability that X5 is less than or equal to so I'm just empirically checking. So this is just an empirical frequentist probability that I'm computing. So let's just run it. 
runs pretty quick. I might not like that decimal precision, it's changed twice. So I could crank up this number and see what this really is. This runs fast enough that no big deal. 0.046. And so this is that distribution. So what I've done is I've checked the distribution of the fifth order statistic. It doesn't look triangular in the same way. Remember the original distribution started back at zero. It was up here and I'm taking something that's budged more towards the right end point because it's the fifth largest thing. Where does that hover around? It hovers big because the density itself is getting stacked towards two. I guess I should do it this direction, stacked towards two. So the fifth biggest thing is somewhere over here, so very rarely does it go below one. I generated all those samples by doing this, the six um, sample size of six. So this is the inverse CDF sample. And maybe some of you know it, so let me just tell you about it. This is always true. So I wish you could always do this. There's some limitations. But it turns out if you can compute f of x, the cumulative, and that's just f of x dx from 0 to, I'll just say minus infinity for an arbitrary problem, off to whatever this thing is, x. If you don't like my notation, you can substitute. So this is my favorite arbitrary letter. So it's actually that thing. So just so we don't confuse what the x's are. So you can just interchange them to something. I think it's common that everybody just recycles the same notation. So we won't do that too often. So that's the cumulative distribution. And then if I can end up writing down what the inverse function is, invert, I can write down f of x. And it turns out that if I end up taking f inverse of a uniform, and I set that equal to xi, I can prove that xi is distributed according to the original density. That's the way I normally write it down. So this is a fact. And that's an algorithm. So compute the cumulative function, take the inverse function of it, shove a uniform into it, and that will be a distributed according to your original function. This is the exact same proof as to why a p-value is uniformly distributed if the null hypothesis is true. So remember that so when we get into chapter 8, you'll go, oh, this is the exact same proof. So is it better that it would be three? Every distribution. Tell me real quickly, why can't you always do this algorithm? for generating, why do we have whole classes on Monte Carlo if it's so easy? You have to compute the cumulative. For a more than one dimensional distribution, what does that mean? So you could probably define it in a coherent way, but you would have to pick some arbitrariness of which way you're packing up everything and stick to that convention. So you probably could do it, so it works one dimensionally. It works when you can actually do the integral in closed form, and it works when you can invert that function. Can we think of any distributions that we can't come up with an analytical form of the CDF? A normal. <laughs> it's a really good example of that. So you can't write it down, they always write down cap V. So, and you can't actually write it down analytically. So. You can integrate over it in the entire range by dropping in a polar coordinate, but you can't integrate just over a partial set of it. So you need other types of samplers. Okay, here's just a proof. Proof of our statement that xi is equal to f inverse ui, um, or that's a uniform zero one, so those are all IID, you're going to generate them independently. 
throw them into this function and you'll get a collection of x's back. We want to show that xi's are coming from f. They have that density, i.e. they have measure cap f. So here's our proof. So I'm just going to look at the probability distribution of f inverse ui, and I'm going to say this is less than or equal to some value right here. I'll call it x. So this is my random variable right here that I'm plugging in, and I want to know what is the probability distribution of that random variable. And so since that's already invertible, I know I can invert it the other direction. If I can write down the inverse, I can go back and forth. So obviously there's some sort of a bijection. So no problem, uniform i is less than or equal to f of x. That's the same thing, so I just invert it on both sides. Same equation, nothing changed. This is a uniform 0, 1. Let me just ask you a question. What's the probability that a uniform 0, 1 is less than 0. 0.7? 0. 0.7. What's the probability that a uniform 0, 1 is less than 0. 0.125? 0.125. What's the probability that the random uniform is less than that thing? It's that thing. So this is f of x right here. So the probability distribution of that thing of f inverse u is cap f. So they are distributed according to cap f. That is the measure. It has density little f. So that's your proof. So I did exactly that. I came up with a cumulative function right here. So if we erase this. I computed our probability for this. This is our cumulative function right here. So this is f of y. It doesn't matter what the argument is. They're just dummy arguments. I just need to know where they live. And so that's f of y, and probably most of you can invert that thing real quickly. So if I take a uniform on the other side, I multiply it by 4, and then I take the square root and solve for y, then I end up with this thing that I wrote down before. So the inverse function f of y is equal to square root of 4 y. This would be f inverse y right here. And instead of plugging y into it, I take my argument and I plug u into it by random uniform. I love this algorithm. I wish you could always do it. It's fast. For one uniform, I'm able to give you one random variable from some other distribution. I will point out all random generators are transforming uniforms. Metropolis Hastings is doing that, important sampling is doing that, everything is some transformation of a uniform. So, just in some weird way. Okay, let's look at this again. Get rid of that for a second. I've made this really big, probably too big, but I want some stability in my decimal places since it's a tiny probability. I'll point out doing something like this, you're effectively doing, when I end up just checking to see how many of these things are less than one right here, I'm effectively doing except reject sampling. So if you know what that is, cool. I will point out that in your homework set, if you know what those algorithms are, it actually makes several of those problems really easy. So there's some transformation of variable problems, and if you know what the inverse CDF sampler is, you can instantly prove everything. So that's just a heads up. Um, these sort of samplers are a little bit tricky to work with because if the probability is small, then the error is large. So I have to crank up the number of samples considerably high to compute things with small probabilities. So. Um, so this probably isn't ideal, but um, it still works for our purposes. Okay, so that's how the code works. I generate out of this inverse function. I'm just plugging in rand1n right there. 
So it's taking this and it's doing it six times for me. It's multi-threading it. It's actually vectorizing the whole thing. So if you know about parallelization on your computer or how the threaders work, that's what this is doing. So it does a lot of magic in the background. So um, pretty, pretty, pretty simple code. Let's just run it one more time. And uh, that's too bad. I think it's actually like 0 0.0046, but we're in the ballpark. This is an approximation. Question is, is could we solve for this analytically and not do the simulation? And that's what we might want to do. So in this case, yes, the answer is definitely you can do this. So let's see how to compute this probability analytically. I'm going to kind of describe what they have in the book and just follow this example and then we'll come and make it more general. Let me draw you a picture. So I know this already. I know what the probability of xi is less than or equal to 1. So this is my argument for y or x. I've kind of said both things. So I plug in an argument for that. I know what this is. This is going to be this thing integrated between 0 and 1. So this is just going to be 1 fourth y squared between 0 and 1. And so that's 1 fourth. So I know what that probability is. Um, that's the probability that each of the xi's is less than 1. What I need for this to happen, for this thing to happen, If I were actually thinking about this as a repeated event, there's two possibilities for this. Either the fifth thing is less than one, or the sixth thing is less than one. So those are the two possibilities that contribute to this probability that the fifth largest thing is less than one. So let me just draw that as a picture. There's two scenarios. So I'm gonna say this is our triangular distribution, that's two, this is zero, and so one is here. So what I could have is I could have five things, one, two, three, four, five, over here. So x5 is there, and x6 is here. That's one possibility. Or, we could have this. So same picture, here's one. I could have all six of them less than one. So this is x6. If the fourth thing was over here, then x5 is not less than one. So I'm just thinking about the number of discrete possibilities for this, for x5 to be less than one. So in each iteration of my for loop, it was checking for examples that look like this. If one of those two examples happened, then x5 was less than 1, and that would contribute to um, some positive probability. So this is scenario 1. And this is scenario 2. I will point out, I don't care which order this all happened. So it doesn't matter which order this happens in. So that could have been the first thing that I generated right here. This could be the second thing that I generated. That could be the third thing that I generated. And there's lots of different ways that you could have arrived at this possibility in terms of the sequence of the original random numbers. Excuse me? Uh, this was. Could you explain why these two scenarios are, are different or are important? Let me show you another scenario. Let me show you a third scenario that does not contribute to this being true. So here's another scenario where I've got one here, and I've got one, two, three, four, and then I have this thing, x5 right here, and x6. So the fourth order statistic 
is less than one, but the fifth one is not less than one. So that is not making that statement true right here. There's only two possibilities in which the fifth thing could be less than one. So if I looked over at the enumeration of those 100,000 samples, the ones where that condition was true were either x5 was less than one or x6 was less than one. If all of a sudden x5 wasn't less than 1, then that didn't contribute to the positiveness of that probability. Well, what about x7? There's no x7. Uh, I see, I see. Thank you. So that's why. So no 7, I pre-specified n was 6. Yeah, that's a good question. Okay, so let me define a random variable for you. So I'm taking this continuous problem and I'm turning it into something discrete. So I've got these discrete possibilities and I'm going to compute the probability on this thing right here and not think about the original continuous, continuousness of the random variable, but instead I've decomposed this into a discrete probability problem. So let's just define a new random variable. Z is equal to the number of Xi's that are less than 1. So in general, we would let that be the W argument, but I'm just plugging in some number for it. So the book ended up plugging in some dummy argument right there. I'm just contextualizing this. And so I can decompose this problem, the probability that x5 is less than or equal to 1, into this problem. The probability that z is equal to 5, or the probability that z is equal to 6. So this is scenario 1. This thing. And this is scenario 2. And so all we need to do is figure out the number of ways that could have happened and the number of ways that could have happened. So this is a binomial probability calculation. So either it happened or it didn't happen, and I just need to enumerate the number of ways that it could happen. So the number of ways that z could be 5, I don't care how this happened. I could reorder this in five factorial different ways and it would still be exactly the same picture. So I don't care what the labels are on all of this. And so they're all labeled with x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, somewhere, it could have been x6 in here. There are unique values in here. There are unique instances, I should say. I guess there could be a repeated value in there, but I would treat them uniquely. Because the problem is continuous, it would never actually happen, but it doesn't matter. So I can rearrange this five factorial different ways, and I can rearrange that one factorial way. There's only one way to do that. And I can rearrange this six factorial ways. And no factorial ways over here. Zero factorial is one as well. And so this is just going to be six choose five times the probability that it happened. So that's going to be my cumulative probability, one-fourth to the five, times the complementary probability, one minus three-fourths to the one. Scenario two can happen in basically one way. Let me just write this down and then I'll get it. Did I make a mistake? Yeah, it is. Duh. <laughs> yeah. We would have been able to notice that that was wrong. So that would be a minus two on a homework set. So easy to fix, obviously wrong. Don't do that on a midterm. So six choose six. One fourth to the six. Each one of those things is less than one with that probability. They're all independent of each other. We power it up to the sixth power. And I'll write this one in as what I meant to do last time. That's the complementary probability raised to the zero. 
And so if we computed this, it would be approximately 0.0046. That number that we are simulating. I think the 46 is closer than the 47. So you can go back to your calculators, plug those numbers in, and see if that's true. So that's how you actually do that. And that's one of the formulas in your book. So for the J-border statistic, it's going to comprise a sum from J up to N. And it's the number of ways that you can pull things over to whatever that accumulated point is. We'll write that down on Friday. So, but that's the essence of where that formula is coming from. So it's a little bit hard to remember unless you're thinking about this picture and what it actually represents. So I never see formulas, I see concepts. And I don't understand the formula until I can actually see the concept, draw a thing, and implement it. Okay, let me just make this more general. More generally. Let's look at this. The probability that x5, same problem, is less than or equal to this number y. So instead of 1 and having a concrete probability, I'm going to write down the formula in terms of y, where y lives between 0 and 2. So just some number in there. And so we can follow this exact same pattern that we had before. So this is going to be equal to 6 choose 5. So times f of y. That's how I computed that one fourth in the first place. I just plugged in some numbers for it. So this is going to be raised to the fifth power, one minus f of y, and this is going to be raised to the first power. Plus, I'll write it out like this, f of y to the sixth. So you'll notice that this thing right here is one, and that thing right there is 1. So this is a, just the original cumulative probability powered up to n, which is 6 in this case. So that would be the more general probability. I'm still thinking about that exact same picture. Now let's try to solve for the density. So that's probably the formula that's a little bit more elusive for people, is what's the density function. If I asked you for the probability and you knew what the density was, you could do this other calculation. You could always integrate over that, input, that density and not have to work through the cumulative sum. So, which might be nice. You could imagine I asked you to compute something on an exam and J is not close to N. So you have to sum over a whole bunch of things. If you could write down the density function for this and integrate over it, that might be a simpler calculation. So, lots of different ways to attack the same problem. So let's look at this. F, X, N. I'll write it out like that. I switched everything to an X again, so arbitrarily. And this thing right here is just going to be, so maybe I'll, I'll make it Y so I can stay consistent for a minute. So f of y, what is that thing? I'm just going to take a derivative with respect to y of whatever this thing is right here. Probability of x5 less than or equal to y. So I'll just take a derivative over this thing. So this is this. Just uh, give us a little bit more knowledge. So, a little bit of chain rule. So, I'll need you to help me out a little bit. Let's just work on this one. So, I'm going to take the derivative of this thing right here. I'm going to actually plug in some numbers for this. So, let's just write this out a little bit more clearly. 6 choose 5. This is going to be y squared over 4. That was my cumulative probability right here. This is going to be times 1 minus y squared over 4. 
plus 626. I'll get rid of that. This is just going to be y squared over 4 raised to the 6th power. So I've got some product rule to do right here with a little bit of chain rule, and I've got some chain rule there. So let me first work on the derivative of this thing, and then I'll add it to the derivative of that. Did we lose a fifth power on the... Yes, we did. Totally. Thank you. Okay. So let's chisel away. So 6 choose 5. I'll take the derivative of this thing first, multiply it into that. So this is going to be 5 times y squared over 4. Derivative of that thing is going to be 2y over 4. So that's chain rule. Multiply by that thing. Plus derivative of that thing times this stuff. We still haven't touched that yet. So this is going to be 6 choose 5. So y squared over 4 raised to the fifth. And then I'm going to have derivative of this thing directly. So this is going to be minus 2y over 4. Be careful with that minus sign. So it's there. I can probably pull it outside. But we'll keep in mind that it's there. Uh, you forgot to look for um, 5y squared over 4. Yes! Thank you. I'm so glad I'm not a calculus teacher. <laughs> so I'm probably like most of you. It's like, don't explain to me on the board. I'll just do it real quick. <laughs> so yeah, keep your eyes on me because I'm liable to think I know what I said and wrote down, and I'm wrong. OK, now plus this one. So this is going to be 6 times y squared over 4 to the fifth power times the chain rule. So this is going to be 2y over 4. I want you to see what happens right here. This number 6 choose 5. That's an easy binomial probability to compute. That's 6. So 6 factorial divided by 5 factorial is 6. Divided by 1 factorial is 1, so it's still 6. So I want you to see that this thing is that thing. And there's a minus sign right in front of it. This is not a coincidence. So if we worked with something like the fourth order statistic, we just have more terms. And everything would cancel each other except for one of the terms. That will happen every single time. If you, need to, if you need to convince yourself of that, just work through a couple problems and you'll see it. So this, these cancel each other. That always happens. You can kind of see it that you're going to be taking these derivatives of this one minus thing, the complementary probability. So you're going to have terms that are positive and terms that are negative. You can see that right away. You probably can't see that everything cancels, but it does. So that's why I picked five and not four, so I didn't have another four derivatives to mess up. This is your answer right here. I want to show you a couple things. So our answer at the end of the day is this. F of x5 plug in y is going to be 6 choose 5 times 5 times y squared over 4 times 2y over 4. We could simplify that if we wanted to. That's 1 half y. Might look familiar to you. Times this thing. Oh, this is raised to the fourth power. 1 minus y squared divided by 4. Yes. So let's just rewrite this real quickly. This is going to be 6 factorial over 5 factorial over 1 factorial times 5. So that's going to cancel out one of those right here. 
So I'm going to cancel that out and replace that with a 4 factorial. So that's kind of nice. So I'll get rid of that. So that's what that whole thing looks like. I'll remind you this is the cumulative distribution. So this right here was f of y. This is powered up to the 4. This is the density function. That's not a coincidence. So this is little f y, our original density. That's powered up to the 1. And this is my cumulative, my complementary probability. 1 minus f y, and that's powered up to the 1. Let me draw you a picture. And this is what I normally think about when I'm deriving these things in general. I can forget all of this stuff, but I cannot forget the picture I'm about to draw. So let's just think about this. This is going to be, you're going to have over here, this is going to be the position of the fifth order statistic. So this is going to be the fifth thing. It happens here right here, and if I wanted to think about what's the probability that it was in some region, I might end up just drawing some bounds over here and then thinking about this tolerance right here is this number minus epsilon and this number plus epsilon. So I could just think about this small window around that fifth thing, and I could start talking about a probability of that thing in that small window. So. If you notice what I'm doing is I'm setting up a calculus limiting argument for inducing a density function. So how many things are over here? There's four things over here. One, two, three, four, because that's the fifth thing over here. That's the fifth biggest thing. And there's one thing over here. I don't care about the number of ways that the, the labels on these. They could have happened in any way, and I consider it the same event. So there's lots of ways that I could have had four things over here. How many different ways could I shuffle them and not care about the difference? Four factorial different ways. How many different ways can I shuffle that? There aren't too many options. One factorial. How many ways can I shuffle that? There's no options there. That's one way of doing that as well. What's the probability that these four things wound up over here? Whatever this was. So this is y. This is my actual point right here that I'm evaluating the density at. So what's the probability things are to the left of y? Yeah, it's f of y. So these happen with probability f of y. So all of this stuff. What's the probability that this thing is over here? It's, that's it. 1 minus f of y. So here's why I did this. What's the probability something's in there? Well, I can compute that probability explicitly, but I can start thinking about this if I take epsilon and I drive it down to 0. And I think about this thing that's not the probability, but it's the instantaneous rate. And so instead of thinking about the probability and I'm thinking about what happens at a point, then I'm talking about the density function. So if you wanted to butter up a full-blown limiting argument, you would talk about things happening in this window and then drive that window down to zero, and you would get the density function. So this happens with probability f little f y. It's not a probability. It's the instantaneous thing. So the derivative. So if you understood that proof and for the fundamental theorem of calculus a long time ago, or you understood what the, how to define a derivative, this is that. So in general, you can do this a little bit differently. So that's what happens here, but let's just talk about the jth order statistic real quickly. And we'll come back on Friday and we'll pick up with this after J Young does a bootstrap. So let's just talk about what's f of x j y. 
So this is the density function. I would do exactly the same thing. I'd drop down my y point right there. This is going to be my j biggest thing. So that means that I have some number of things over here. How many are there? J minus one. J minus one things. They all happen with cumulative probability f of y. How many different ways can I rearrange these J minus one things? J minus one factorial different permutations of that. How many things are over here? And minus J. This will be the hardest question we do with the joint order statistics. I'm going to draw you a similar picture, and at 9 o'clock in the morning, we'll be like, how many things are in that little window? So see if you can figure that out. That seems to be the thing that most people stumble around with, and they, they're off by counting by one, and they're usually off by counting by that thing. So that's the minus one right there that we removed. So this is going to be n minus j things, and it, they all happen with probability this. The cumulative. So if I write all that down and I come up with this associated probability, I'm going to write it down right here. This thing is going to be how many different ways can I permute everything n factorial? I'm going to take out the orderings that I don't care about. They're these j minus 1 factorial, n minus j factorial times f of y, how many things, j minus 1, times this thing right here, this is just f y, not a probability, but the instantaneous thing, there's only one of those, and then I have 1 minus f y, n minus j. We'll come back next time, rewrite this out, talk about the cumulative function again. But if I didn't know what the cumulative function was and I didn't want to sum from j up to n, I might be able to write down the density real quickly and integrate over it really fast. Lots of different ways to do the same problem. So we'll come back, we'll draw in a more general picture for more order statistics and make sure we understand this. But ultimately, that's everything your book is saying, just with the picture. Have a good weekend, you guys. Hopefully you enjoy Monday and Wednesday. Let me know how that goes on Friday when I come back, and I'll see you on Friday.